and moved to Vegas and really began to explore what it meant to be self. So when you say what it meant to be self, you mean um, to accept yourself, but to also uh, reveal yourself without any fear? Yeah, I definitely feel like it was both of those components. I come from a very black Christian family. And when that is the only framework that you have, in, in, at least in my experience, um, it really stripped me of my confidence. And I really had to do the work to not only build it back, but also own all the parts of my story and be proud of it. Right, right. Especially with that. I know in that uh, that black Christian community, because I've seen it time and time again, um, and my friends and everything, when it comes to mental health and struggling with anxiety or depression or stuff like that, I was actually watching a Juice World interview um, just like a week ago, and he was talking about how he couldn't go to his his mom about his his mental health issues, like his anxiety or his depression, because she would pretty much just say, okay, let's go to church, instead of trying to help him find that professional help. And so did that kind of reflect on you as well? Was there a lot of... So I'll say, at least in my immediate family, that was not the case. My mom was a very a big um, uh, advocate for therapy and counseling and, and things of that nature, especially after my parents' separation and divorce. Um, but that is not the the case with with many um i know for me even growing up like my mom did what she could but there was that financial component that was there as well back then that you know a lot of the services and stuff that we have today didn't exist back then um and so i i have friends and family members who's that that was not their story you know uh you know and, and a lot of times in black culture it's like oh if you're sick take a tylenol put some vicks on your chest uh have a seven up and you're good <laughs> and it's kind of that it's kind of that same thing as it relates to mental health for a lot of people in that community in our community because it's like no black black people don't we don't have that like that doesn't like that doesn't exist when obviously we we know that it does right right 100 percent. i well I, and you know i wouldn't even just categorize that into into black people but you know like there's a lot of uh a lot of people who like for instance if you if we're going to talk about like upper class people um you know, like, even if we're talking specifically with, like, white people, they would take their kids to the doctor and be like, yo, Timmy's not paying attention in school. Can you just give them some medicine and we can just move forward? There's a lot of people that won't even take the time to question, you know, what they're putting in their kids' bodies. And, you know, then these kids end up on Adderall or whatever it was. Uh, I think that's within every community. And I think now we're approaching a, a time era where mental health has become uh, one of the, the main products of our existence and it's becoming commercialized. Um, which is a good and a bad thing. Yeah, I'm definitely glad that there's conversations around it, you know, because, you know, for us, even, you know, growing up, it was like, oh, Norma's not act or he's not acting right in school. Let's just whip his ass. You know what I mean? <laughs> like <laughs> like yeah. that, that was like the, like the, the, the the remedy you know oh they're they're acting up or they're not doing this let's give them a whooping and right. i think that um the conversations that we're having have shifted that mentality um and i'm really excited to see that yeah it's it's definitely a big part of it and i think one of the biggest parts of it especially with me and my personal story and, and a lot of my struggle especially as of recently was approaching how to be confident and how to take um the baby steps towards being a confident individual and being confident in myself, but also uh, not just pretending to be confident, but actually having true down to the core confidence and belief in myself and, and true self-worth, which I feel like a lot of people struggle to carry that regularly um, in their relationships uh, with their families, with their friends, and then with, with uh you know, the, the new people in their life, those first first impressions, like when you go to a job interview or, you know, like, for instance, you, you like to do public speaking or what we're doing right now. A lot of people would come onto a podcast and, and freeze up and not, right. not know how to approach talking and, and just knowing that there might have been a few people watching. So right. what would you say was your first steps into 
obtaining your own confidence? When did you like realize, when did it click in your head that, that you were something special and that you had to show the world that? I think it just started from me sharing my story because I, I feel, again, as a black gay person, I didn't have or did not have access or did not know that I had access to other people that looked like me that had similar stories to me. And so as I began to share my story, um, I began to feel I began to gain more confidence because it wasn't I wasn't hiding it. And I think a lot of times when when we are, you know, we're taught to mute our voices or quiet our voices or be silent completely, that's where the the lack of confidence comes because we're not owning all parts of our story. And so for me is I accept the good, the bad and the ugly because it's all part of my story. And as I begin to as I began to share and as I continue to do so, the shame and the fear and all of that surrounding my story dropped off because it's like I'm I sit in and I rest in who I am in my totality and what all of those intersections look like. And so as I began to do that, I began to teach my my clients to do the same. And now they're living confident lifestyles as well. And that's I think the the harder part to wrap my mind around sometimes is uh, some people like it's that that whole concept where where you make it look easy, you know what I mean? And and uh, there's so many people out there that will step up and be like, oh well, if he can do it like this, then I can. But then they try and they they don't really succeed in in owning themselves or uh, putting themselves completely out there. And I think, uh, for instance, with me, um, with the situation I've been dealing with. Uh, I've dealt with a spouse having an affair. And so a lot of stuff in my head has been um, about my own self-worth and what may have made the other person worth more or uh, what made me so worthless that, that this happened. Wow. And I had to reach a point where I kind of identified that it wasn't me, that it was them that made those choices. Um, and it took me a while to really reach that spot and I still struggle with it. And yeah. on a consistent basis, you know, thinking about um, what I could have done better, or how I could have been a better person or, or you know, uh, just consistent issues with my own self-worth. And so I think that uh, in the long run, I, I listen to music a lot to approach my emotions. And there's this band I recently found and there's a song called whale watching on it and basically there's a line in it and it's really big to me but it basically they say i am a pond you wanted an ocean and so it's kind of like even though a pond is a very you know beautiful serene spot to to go and relax and maintain yourself right um, right every single human being on this planet will always want more and we covered this in last week's episode actually a lot, um, the concept that there is no finish line, that you're going to reach something and then you're going to want to reach higher. And you're always going to be looking at the people above you thinking, wow, they're doing better. If I could just be there, I'd be happy. Right. And see, that is, see, and I, I for one, I'm here to disrupt that narrative um, because the, it's all bullshit. Like, we all have our own lanes, right? We all have the, our contributions, our skill set, the things that we bring into the world, right? And where lack of, where confidence comes in, it's really easy to say, oh, I'm looking at Norman and he makes it look so easy and I can do it. But the, the thing is, you can't judge where I'm at based on where you entered the story. Because there's a lot that happened behind the scenes. There's a lot that is art that is happening still behind the scenes. Like, and I share people and my clients, there's three things that I encourage all people to do. And I call them the three eyes. We've got to do things imperfectly. Perfection is never going to be something that we attain and it should never be the goal. Okay. Because if we have reached that, then there's no more room for growth or evolution. Also, we want to do things immediately because if you're anything like me, if I drag things out, I will talk myself out of stuff before I even start. You know, like I, like I mentioned, I recently wrote my book. That book had been, I'd been sitting on that book for years because it was like, well, who's going to want to read a book from this gay guy from Chicago? Who, you know, like, I like, it, it goes back to the worthiness, the self-worth. Like, I was like, who would really want to, to read this? And then to do things intentionally, to really... Uh, 
determine and evaluate your why. Why am I doing those things? And I feel like if we do things imperfectly, immediately, and intentionally, it will create the character within us to become that confident person. Yeah, hundred percent. I, and I think what I really appreciate about that is, um, as opposed to dismantling it, I think what you actually did was you took that perspective and made it a positive one. So like w- one thing we were talking about is like, if you, you know, you said you're in your own lane or like you're on your own ladder, really. Um, if you're climbing on the same ladder as someone else and you see it that way and you're like, you know, let's say you're looking at it and uh, they're above you, they're they're further along on that ladder, right? Then you're constantly just looking at their feet and feeling bad about yourself. But if you're climbing your own ladder and you don't strive for that perfection in an understanding that there, there needs to always be a room for growth and that that room for growth is a positive thing and not a negative thing, that that yeah. helps people be able to approach... Um, that whole existence of space yeah. without a negative light. Cause a lot of people, especially in the streaming world, you know, being a streamer that streams full time, a lot of the time streamers will look at a bigger streamer and be like, well, what is this person doing that I'm not? How are they, you know, like, Oh, they're boring. What are they doing? How could they be um, yeah. up here <laughs> doing this while I'm, I'm me and I'm down here. And then you start thinking, well, maybe I'm just trash or maybe I'm just garbage or I don't deserve it. But the thing is, is like, Everybody has their time and uh, the the truth and the facts of the world is regardless of what you're doing with your life, a lot of it comes out of um, creating your your own narrative and speaking things into existence as opposed to, you know, like when you start saying that you're trash or that you're not worth something or you're not going to get viewers, then you're speaking that into existence and you're attracting that existence. But if you start speaking positively, like... Yes, I'm going to write this book. Yes, I'm going to do this. This is something I've done. This is who I am. I'm going to be successful with this. Then you start speaking that into existence, and that's a forward-thinking path that you can walk instead of walking back on yourself. And then just understanding, too, that everyone has their own their own way, their own... Like, for example, as an author and coach, I, I experienced what you just described on a daily basis, you know, I'm like, oh, well, this person wrote a book after me and it's doing this, or, you know, like this person has their broadcast, but at the end of the day, we have to honor where we are, you know, and even going back to, as it relates to mental health, there are some days that for me, the win is making it from my bedroom to the shower. And I honor that and I celebrate that, you know, and there's other days that I book a, a huge paid speaking contract. And I celebrate those things too. But I also uh, understand that I, you have to celebrate every win, whether it's big or small. And, you know, and I think COVID um, in 2020 really taught me that because there was some days that I couldn't get out of bed. Like I physically felt like I could not. And so I celebrated the win when I made it to the living room, you know, and that was my win. And I was, I was grateful for it. So when would you consider yourself more of an extrovert or an introvert extrovert okay so see we sit on opposite spectrums on that side so a lot of my energy is gained spending time on my own or like when i do spend time with people and still collect energy it's it's in my studio at my house online with my friends right right whereas i'm sure you gain a lot of your energy going out and socializing and, and spending time with a lot of other people and stuff like that. So COVID probably hit you in a different mental state than it hit me. Right. Yeah. It was, it was challenging one because um, in addition to my coaching and authoring, I also work a full-time job that is customer facing and th- it, it literally, it stripped me of all interaction And the crazy part about it, I had just moved into a new apartment, like by myself. So it was just that series of change, like, okay, we're in a new environment, you're by yourself, you can't interact with anyone, you can't interact with your residents at work, you you can't go out and socialize. And so it, um, it really was challenging. However, one of the positive results that came out of that is I now rest well and sit in my own company beautifully. You know, while I am an extrovert, I also appreciate my own company now. And I don't necessarily know that I did that pre-COVID. I think that's a super important thing to 
acknowledge too. Uh, I've actually talked to my therapist about that um, when we were talking about my personal needs and how I collect energy, and um, she basically made it a point to to let me know that it's possible to be both an introvert and an extrovert and just be like more sided to one side. And uh -huh. there's times where you do like for me, like there is times where I do need that social inter interaction. Um, right. Just like for extroverts, there is that time where you do need to find safety and solace in being alone and right. um, being able to comfort yourself. But also uh, like, like for instance, when, when you were <coughs> putting together this book and writing this book, were you spending time with other people while you did it? Or were you alone with yourself while you wrote? Alone by myself when I wrote. So most people, when they when they're creating uh, art, writing, music, um, whatever it may be, typically they're alone when they do that, and that that form of expression is also a form of um, being able to push out your your emotions and, and the stuff that's inside of you, and being able to understand yourself better as well as the other things so i know with your book there's a uh you know it's more of a each you know how steve had a shower thoughts how it was like oh here's this thought your, right your, your book is more of a, a thought on not just I, I you know i know it's about confidence but i think it approaches a lot of other aspects of mental health um while touching on confidence and i think the biggest thing that I've noticed doing this podcast is like, we'll be talking about one subject uh -huh. and next thing you know, there's eight other parts of mental health that are just tied into that. They all kind of right. just like mesh with each other. And so with the importance of confidence and, and stepping up and being able to speak for yourself and being able to be yourself, um, I think, what would you say was the biggest struggle with, with approaching um, living this kind of lifestyle? being okay that some people were going to fall off. I think that that was the biggest part of me because I hold my, you know, my personal connections, my relationships, I hold those at, on very high regard. Um, but I also understand that life sometimes can be like an elevator and sometimes there's a capacity and not everyone can go with you where you're going. And that was extremely hard, extremely challenging um, to accept because who I am as person beforehand was identified by who I associated myself with and understanding that now I'm embarking upon a journey where I am discovering myself and that means doing a lot of this alone. And I think that was scary for me. You were branching away from that uh, extroverted side and that dependency you sort of had on on the people around you. Yeah, um, for sure. Especially being so uh, hidden with yourself. There's right. a, I, I think, overcoming the concept of setting your boundaries and cutting ties with the people who wouldn't accept you for who you are, right? Yeah, and the thing about it is, is boundaries are so huge. And, you know, I work with my clients on the concept of not just setting boundaries around people, um, but also setting boundaries around our own mentality and our past. Like, so for me, I had this idea that I could never have a successful relationship, um, even as a gay person, because my dad um, left at such an early age, right? And I allowed that to... I spoke that and I allowed that to be my reality. Um, where, but one day it's like, well, Norman, okay, at 35 or at what, you know, how much longer are we going to hold someone else responsible for, for your current situation? And so I had to create a boundary around that particular experience and framework so that I could move forward and be in a healthy relationship. And that's a really big thing to acknowledge and be open about too. Cause like, my real dad left me and my little brother when I was like three years old. And the impact that that had on my life was a lot bigger than I had thought it was. And I think, yeah. that, you know, we, we find ourselves sort of um, pushing the blame onto other people based on our circumstances and, and their decisions. And in, yeah. in, in turn, we let their decisions kind of have power over us. Right. And then we just, that, but it makes it easier to justify. I'm this way because of X, Y, Z. 
I act and speak this way because of X, Y, Z, you know, and, and it's, it, and it's, and it's crazy. And I'm again, here to disrupt that narrative. You know, I lean into that. I lean into that part of my story and I'm very public about every part of my story, you know, even, you know, dealing with the relationship that I have with my mother, you know, that was, it was a, a, a very touch and go situation for quite some time. And I was only able to grow into that or from that once i acknowledged that okay it's not her fault i can't hold her responsible it's time for me to take my power back and i did that by sharing my story publicly yeah how did your mom feel about you sharing that so in the beginning like when i started you know moving into the coaching space authoring and all of that i did have a conversation with my family and i said these are the things that i'm going to talk about because there's someone else that needs to hear that so when i came out to my mom she said oh you're not going to live to see 30 years old right and so now that's one of my speaking topics because there's someone else that has experienced something like that and and it, they may not have had the tools that i had to get through that you know up until my 30th birthday i used to dread my birthday because subconsciously it was this association with death almost and it was really bizarre um but then i realized after a conversation and my mom doing the work on her and too that that came from a, a really a, a space of fear not necessarily saying like you're gonna die but it was very much i fear for my child because i love you so much and all my only framework to acknowledge this is everything that I've seen in my past. And so, you know, luckily we were able to, you know, repair that and now we're super close. But if I had not shared that, there would have been people who would have thought that they were the only one or thought that there was something wrong with them because their parents approached, you know, their, their life or their situation in a particular way. So would you say that some of the first steps to because we we talk about uh progression a lot in the sense of baby steps uh -huh. um and the analogy we typically use is one that i was showed one of my therapists showed me um basically the neurological pathways are like a field of tall grass and when you walk through that grass enough you set a path that you're going to keep taking and if that's an unhealthy path it's harder to get off that path so you need to start taking the baby steps onto a healthier path and start creating the new one until it's easier to walk it. Uh -huh. and so would you say that the, the, the baby steps at the very beginning, um, I guess for you, maybe, maybe for most people would be um, branching out and being more open and having open communication on your emotions and who you are with the people that you love. See, I think it, it starts even in a different direction. I feel like it starts with having those conversations with self then because I use the analogy, like when you're on an airplane and those masks come down, they say, put your mask on first and then assist the people around you and, you know, help them. So I, I believe that those conversations, that internal dialogue, that discussion, that starts with self first, because I feel like for me, at least in my experience, I had to know that I was strong enough when I had those conversations with other people that if they went completely left, that I would still be okay. So you yeah. kind of had to approach your own acceptance before sort of uh, guiding people into accepting who you were as well. Right. And, and being okay with them not accepting me. Because at that point, I've already accepted myself. I love myself in totality. I am over the top and that's just enough. And once I was okay with that and I, I embodied that, it was easier for me to share my story and interact with other people because at this point, this is who I am. You can take it or leave it. And either way, I'm still going to be good. You're going to find your happiness within yourself and you don't. Yeah. Need I, yeah. Happiness. I already have it. I got it. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. I think that's one thing that I've had to approach in my life too, especially with uh, love and relationships. Um, finding the point where I could be happy by myself on my own, um, regardless of who comes in and out of my life. And uh -huh. that's a big part of uh, approaching not just confidence, but uh, happiness in general yeah. um, is acknowledging that no one else is going to be able to provide that for you. Nope. So that's a pretty big step. Yeah. And we come from two very different backgrounds. You know, uh, I come from a very, 
I had a, a very conventional Christian family growing up, but um, I was definitely more on the privileged side for a while. Like I, when, when I had a single mom, um, we never really struggled because my mom's parents were always wealthy enough to provide for anyone and everyone in the family that needed something. So me um, never really having to struggle on any of those fronts, I had a lot of open space to kind of do what I want. And uh, I think for me, it took a lot of hard lessons to, to really figure out myself. But I found that part of myself, um, I think when I was probably 15 or 16, I really started branching into different phases with different styles, uh, wearing, you know, girl jeans and embracing my little emo phase and everything in between. And I, I found that as I was doing these more weird things with my style and really trying, cause I have a very feminine side um, that I never really spoke for until I really reached a point where I felt like this is who I am, this is what I'm gonna be. And I got to a point where uh, with my parents, I just kind of had to show them because they were very close minded to a lot of things in the world that um, I was gonna be me and I was gonna do what I do regardless of if they loved me or not and if they chose not to love me that i wasn't afraid to not have them in my life which is a really like a lot of people have a hard time uh expressing that towards family members especially or like towards their mom specifically because you have yeah. this huge attachment to your mom but for me as much as i love my mom i was just like look mom i'm gonna get tattoos uh, at the time, I was like, I'm gonna smoke weed. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna be who I am, and this is what helps me mentally in my day to day. And if you don't want to love and accept me, you don't have to, you know. And at that point, I think she realized she had two choices. It was either she loves and accepts me for who I am, or she's not really a part of my life, like a substantial part. And um, right. they, they ended up paying for my first tattoo. Uh, they are now at a point where smoking weed isn't an issue. They're also at a point where um, my mom just messaged me like two days ago and she wants to get her first tattoo. And so like there, it's, it's crazy to see how being yourself and being open and confident with your communication and, and, and owning that can motivate other people to kind of grow into that as well. Well, it gives them permission. It gives them permission to to explore or to inquire or, you know, it gives that that it opens up that sense of discovery. And again, it's it's the confidence the, it's the confidence portion, because that took confidence to be able to say, I'm going to do this regardless. And when you truly stand in that people, are, oh, OK, and, 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 it, and it trickles down. Right. And, and showing people that you truly don't have a problem with what other people think. So like, right. one thing I've been going through recently, um, you know, with my wife having an affair and then afterwards, we, we, we went through a, a couple different stages of processing and we're still going through it uh, on a on a day to day basis. Right. Um, I'm still with her, but we are also now in a polyamorous relationship with another girl. And a lot of people that are close to me wanted to express how they thought that I was just creating a band-aid for the situation or how dating this other person would take me away from my wife and my daughter. And there was obviously a ton of concern, right? A ton of, um, I, w I don't know if I'd say judgment. There's probably some judgment, uh -huh. but just a ton of uh, back and forth on people approaching me about how I'm living my life and what I'm doing to, to follow my own heart and to approach my own happiness. Right. Right. And throughout all of this, I had to reach a point where I had to understand that not everyone's going to accept me or what I'm doing or the choices I make. Um, not everything is going to work out exactly how you want it to, regardless of right. who you are, or what you think. Um, and the only thing you can give is your best. Right. Right. And <clears throat> I reached that point. I was like, so at this point, it's like anyone that wants to come at me sideways about, you know, whether it be my wife's mistakes or how I still accept her. Because I've had a lot of people that are like, you should just leave her. You're stupid for not. And trying to, it's like people, people have this dictation to tell you how to live your life based on what they would do or what they think they would do in a situation. Right. And I think that we as human beings can't really express 
to other, you know, you, you will never live in my shoes and I will never live in yours, you know? Right. Right. And for me to own my shoes confidently, I got to put my feet in them. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Period. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Period. So, no, I totally, I totally agree with that. And, and, and that is such a, a, a great example of really sitting in your confidence, like to be able to say, this is what happened. This is what I'm doing. And I'm, and this is me. And that is so huge. Even, you know, being able to, to share on platforms such as this, like this builds confidence, speaking about those things, speaking about the things that we've gone through, um, the things that we're going through um, and kind of how the, the, our mind is processing it and how we're moving forward. I feel like all of that, it builds confidence. Definitely. So as I'm approaching everything, I have a lot of goals in place, right? I have um, things that I want to bring to life that I've never really done before. There's a, I'm, I'm trying to learn how to draw. I'm processing through the idea of writing a book of my own um, from a very different, I think everyone that writes obviously writes from their own, own place, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I've looked at what you've done and I have a few other friends that have also written books and stuff. And I think the, the thing that has been hitting me is I don't know where the fuck to start. <laughs> I, I, I sit and I'm like, man, I know I can do this and I'm going to do this, but I haven't actually sat down and started, started the process yet. And, um, what, what would you say when you, when you were writing your book, when you originally came up with the idea of what you're going to write and everything, uh, what pushed you to just start and to just do it? I knew that I, so one is I put a date on it, right? I said, I want my book done by March 21st. Like it was just, that was the date. Um, but then I also understand like, for example, I don't know anything about streaming, right? So I'm not going to learn about all of that today. I'd never written, I had never written a book. I was not about to do all of, you know? And so what I did is I hired a coach that specifically is an expert in writing publishing, all of that. So now it was like, it was double fold. So I made an investment, right? And so now I really felt compelled to see this thing through. But then I was able to collapse my time by working with someone who had already done this. So it was like, okay, Norman, you do it this way, this way, this way, bada bing, and the book was done. And so that to me is if you're able to work with someone that in their level or their area of expertise, you know, like I'll have people that come to want to work with me. And after I talk with them, it's like, no, you don't need a confidence coach. You need a business development coach or you need a therapist or you need a, a, a different type of thing because as a confident person, I own my area of expertise and that's it. I'm not going to teach you how to start your business. I can't teach you how to save your marriage. I can't teach those things. But what I can teach you is how to be the confident badass that already exists on the inside of you. And so that's, you know, that's just where I'm at. Right. Regardless of the situations around you. And yeah. That's, I think it's important to acknowledge those things. Um, have you like done any like life coaching or uh, life coach training? I have. So I am a certified life coach and um, <laughs> I, I do, I am a coach. So I work with clients in a couple of different ways. I have clients that I work with one-on-one -on -one that necessarily don't want to work in a group container setting. Um, but I also have a, a six week um, mentorship and coaching program. So what, what would you say was if you, if you had to take like a top three things that you learned um, through your experience with life coaching, what would be the top three things you would take away and hand to someone? Not everyone is your client and it's okay. It's okay to say, you know what? You're, this is not gonna be a good fit because I feel like as a life coach, especially a new coach, we're just eager to get going, you know? And I've been doing this for two years now, but we've just been, we're eager to get going. And so we wanna say yes to everyone. So understanding that not everyone is your client understand the importance of niching down <laughs> you know i'm not here to teach confidence to everyone because that's not my that ne not, is not necessarily my my clientele so understanding that that it's okay for you to be very specific in your good services and offerings like it's okay to do that and then lastly understand that no one knows when you fuck up 
And so what I mean by that is a lot of times we put this emphasis on, again, perfection. And, and, and I, I don't agree with that. You know, for me, even as a public speaker, I still get nervous when I speak. Like even like being here today, I'm nervous every single time. I, I it's the same thing, but I get out and I do it. So understanding that it doesn't have to be perfect, we just have to get up and get it started. Let's just get it moving. Taking that first step and then getting that momentum, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's one thing that uh, it's like a snowball effect. It's like as soon as you start pushing it down the hill, it kind of starts rolling on its own. As you know, like you're not going to stop once you start most of the time. Some people, you know, they do, but. Um, well, see, those are the people that I call, those are motivated people. And the thing is, I don't really like dealing with motivated people because I feel like motivation only gets you so far. Like even think about it, like um, from a new year's resolution perspective, right? Okay. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm feeling really pumped. I'm feeling really motivated. Right. But what about those days that you don't feel motivated or those di- or those days where you, you know, maybe went to bed late? Dedication is what gets you the rest of the way. And so I'm, I, will, I will deal with a dedicated person over a motivated person any day because to me, motivation can be very fleeting. Yeah, someone who just like, for me, it's like, uh, I don't find the dedication unless it's something I'm passionate about. And so right. it's hard for me um, to to go to the gym. So to speak. like, well, that's a perfect example for me is because like, I'll be like, yeah, dude, I don't want to be fat anymore. I want to look good. I want to do this and this and this. But I don't have like a huge passion towards like being a, a model or, uh, you know, whatever I would do with that body in the long run. That's not where a lot of my passion lies. A lot of my passion lies with the art that I create. And so when I find myself dumping myself into something or being completely dedicated, it's to the the creation of music or art or like my stream, for example. And I think what you said about the life coaching, not everyone being your client, that can apply to anyone that does anything, you know, like um, with streaming, that's one thing I've had to realize in the five years of being a, a video game streamer, there's been people that come in and they support and they support and they support and then they disappear. And, uh-huh. um, you have to kind of learn that uh, everybody will touch each other in a way and some will fade and some won't. And you have to learn to be okay with that fading, regardless of who it is. You have to be, and you have to learn to be okay with um, circumstances that may happen that cause you to, to cut ties with someone, especially if someone goes outside of your boundaries or someone pushes you to go outside of your own boundaries. You have to be okay with cutting ties with with the people that cause you to go down those paths exactly exactly and 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 understanding that they were not meant for you to go in they weren't meant for the rest of that journey they served their purpose you know for whatever reason they were in your life and now it's time for them to go and and understanding and and really uh, looking at our circle looking at the people that are closest to us excuse me, and making sure that those people are the ones that su- support us, the ones that push us, the ones that encourage us, the ones that understand that today I may not be having the best day and I need to be left alone. Or, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's important to have those people in your circle. Yeah, 100%. So I think now is probably a good time to share the first page. So I, I picked out five pages out of uh, Norman's book um, that... Because I've gone through it all, and I've actually read it like a few times. But I there, appreciate that. There were some that really stood out to me, um, and I wanted to just like give kind of a sneak peek to Norman's book. And then, if anyone is interested in purchasing the book, we're, we'll be able to provide that information to you as well. And sure. Norman also wanted to do a giveaway um, and and give out one of his books to someone um now this is typically a night stream so usually i'll be streaming at about 11 p.m central so a lot of our people are either asleep or at work right now so if if we don't have like a ton of people in here right now i always post the episodes to youtube afterwards and um i can make a post on my page about the giveaway and kind of do it that way as well cool we don't have anyone super active because right lately it's been 
significantly less active and I see people saying, oh, I'm at work, kind of listening, but I'm at work. And right. Just, no, I get that. Yeah, for sure. It's just part of a uh, there's there's many times where I've done day day podcasts because doing it with guests, you know, um, you have to be able to make yourself available when they're available as well. And so that's why I like to be able to take everything and put it on on YouTube and um, have it there for anyone that wants to listen later as well. I love that. So the first page that I enjoyed was bloom, whether you're watered or not. I said what I said. Confident people do not wait on others to push them. We push ourselves. We grow in an environment because we have to. So that kind of reminded me of like a cactus in a way. You know what I mean? Uh -huh, like uh -huh. uh, they're in an environment that is not necessarily like huge for uh, <laughs> for other plants, right? Like you don't have yeah. – like I used to live in Arizona and all you see – for the most part, are just cactuses, like everywhere, especially the saguaro, the big one. But they they're huge, and they're actually like really beautiful. Um, but it's like they're not watered; they they're in a desert, so instead right. they they provide their own water, right? Like cactus have water inside of them, and that's like for me that it kind of just vibe with me. Like um, we as humans are are a cacti, right? We we, we are our own water um yeah like that kind of concept of be be your own cheerleader um root yourself on speak yourself into existence be positive uh i think that one hit me pretty hard because i've always um beat myself up more than i should or i've looked for like for, for i don't know if you know about the five love languages but one of my biggest ones was words of affirmation so i kind of depended on it or would go fishing for those words yeah instead oh i get of, it instead of giving them to myself and right. i think that's something that i've definitely needed to work on and i have not put the work in um confidently speaking to myself and talking to myself positively so well uh, there's no there's as my mom would say there's nothing to it but to do it you know i i utilize a, a and it's in the book too a, a technique called the catch and switch and that has been something that's been monumental for me to maintain a positive and confident attitude that moment that i began to speak to myself negatively or begin to believe some made-up delusional stuff about myself i immediately catch that and i switch it into an affirming uh, uh dialogue with myself immediately and i find that at first like so the for the first time when a client works for me we do that for 24 hours right so each time that you want to say i want you to look and see how many times you do that i did that and it was crazy to me to see how negatively and how frequently i was talking to myself that way and so when I got in the habit of switching those things into positive affirmations, it became easier to do. And the negative self-talk was greatly decreased. Which is a very big thing. And that's also uh, one thing that my therapist was working with me on. Was it's it's a, a technique called filtering. And basically you, the concept of having a filter and every thought that comes in, you acknowledge the thought mm -hmm. and then you assess whether it's positive or negative. And positive she explained was essentially things that you can control um things that are good and i don't remember the third prospect of it but the negative was essentially thing or things that are rational whereas the negative is irrational stuff you can't control and just bad bad thoughts so right <clears throat> um like for instance you can't control the past you can't change the past so if you have a negative thought about the past it's not something that you should dwell on and you should filter that out and get rid of it. that's right that's right um whereas if you have something positive you take that and you harness it and you start focusing on that as opposed to focusing on the negative and mm -hmm. um the chemicals that that releases in your brain uh is like a very good thing to combat depression to combat a lot of issues that you have um with your inner self in in turn helping you be confident within yourself so right. i think that that whole water yourself mentality um and not depending on the people around you to water you because even if you do have a really big support system um and they all do really like you uh, what I like, for instance, with me, with my streaming community, I do have a lot of people that, that like me, they do compliment me, they do like me, um, they speak positively of me. Um, 
a lot of the times I find myself not embracing what they say because of the things that I say about myself. Right. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> you know, like, yeah, because the things that we say to ourselves is always going to be louder than the things that we hear from other people. Always. That's one of the harder parts of it to deal with. But yeah. I, I'd say for me, that's the hardest part is speaking positively to myself. And because um, I've always had a very depressionist mindset and I've always identified with my sadness. And my sadness has always been like a part of who I am or it's like what makes me who I am. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. um, it kind of like I've always had a really unhealthy mindset to where I have to wrap myself around that sadness to embrace who I am. Whereas, um, now I'm starting to approach the concept of looking at all of my emotions and the things I've been through, through a snow globe. Um, mm -hmm. so to speak, the concept that I have all of these things and I can shake it up and watch it and feel it. <laughs> right. But I have the distance instead of, it, you know, like cracking the, the snow globe open and dumping it on myself. I have, <laughs> right. I have the distance between myself and, and my emotions. So I'm acknowledging my emotions and knowing what they are, but not attaching myself to them. And that's yeah. one of the harder things I've been dealing with um, personally is providing that distance. But um, I think one thing, actually, it was one of the other pages that I that I had was uh Understand that the company you keep affects the flow of your business, relationships, and life. Uh, whenever I was younger, I remember watching the Kids' Choice Awards um, on Nickelodeon, and uh, <laughs> Will, Will Smith. Will Smith was the host, and he came up and he just he had one message for for the younger generation, and it was this has stuck with me since I was a little kid. That's what's crazy about it is like I don't even think I I was like a really huge Will Smith fan or anything when I was a little kid. It was just. I was watching it. I was like, "Kids' Choice Awards, yeah, fuck yeah, I'm gonna watch this. This is tight." Like Nickelodeon slime time, all that shit. It was, it was a vibe, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and so my little kid ass was sitting there, and he said, he came up and he said, "If there's one thing that I can give you guys as a piece of advice um, to the younger generation as you're growing older, it's that you are who you hang out with, uh -huh. and that you will become who you hang out with. And so, like, be aware of the people you spend your time with because." If you see someone and you're like, man, I really don't want to be like that, but I'll accept them and spend time with them, but I don't want to be like that. You're going to become like that. You, uh -huh. Human beings have a copy paste mentality where um, even if you're a leader, the people that you surround yourself with have more of an impact on you than you know. And if they're going outside of your boundaries, you have to understand that you're going to go outside of your, your own boundaries. And exactly. So exactly. I think... That was one of my favorite pages because it's something that I just relate to heavily um, yeah. with decisions that you make. And like, for instance, um, what they teach you in rehab, if you're a drug addict, don't have drug addict friends. They teach you that. They're like, even if it's like one of your best friends in the whole wide world, if they're a drug addict and you're a drug addict, guess where you're both going to be in the end when you spend time together doing drugs. That's just, it's something they teach you. It's, it's just how human mentality works. It's that whole um, give you permission thing. Like when I was talking about with my mom and everything, it's the same concept. Like uh -huh. if someone's acting a certain way and you don't like that, and then you start spending time with that person and caring about that person, they're sort of opening a door for you to give yourself permission to act that way. Exactly. Exactly. I agree. I agree. 100%. And I think that is one of the major shifts that happened for me in 2019. Um, I made a very conscious effort of who I associate with um, professionally, personally, in terms of relationships, all of that. You know, I wanted to be around people who were, you know, entrepreneurs and and business owners and people who were living their best life and the people that were confident and people that you know were were challenging themselves and growing and developing themselves and that was one that honestly was one of the most most significant shifts that I made back in March of 2019 and it was with that decision that gave me permission to really be me authentically
sort of weeding the the bad ones out and breeding the good ones into your life type deal yeah and and being around people that appreciate what i bring into the room the energy that i bring to the room uh and it's it's changed the game for me because i wasn't used to having people that uh appreciated my gifts talents and skills you know and so to be that and to be in that place it really gave me permission okay norman this you are you are moving towards alignment you're right where you need to be so what other ambitions do you have what other goals do you have in mind after after finishing this book and pushing this book out what 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 do you think is next Oh, there's so many things down the pipeline. Um, so we got our new merch out, uh, the over-the-top living signature tees. Um, there will be a journal to accompany this book that will be released in quarter four. Um, and I'm also working on a children's book in addition to you know my coaching and, and all of that. But my ambition is to continue to help people one person at a time, one confident unicorn at a time. And I... I'm looking very much forward to when I no longer have to work my nine to five and that I can really put 100% of my being, my passion, my heart into, into my business. So when you say a journal, do you mean like kind of a guided journal? Like, uh, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be prompted. Okay. Okay. And then for the children's book, is this like a subconscious, teach them confidence before they grow up? Or is this just something that was a side thing that you just wanted to write a kid's book? So this one is, the kid's book is actually going to be geared toward the acceptance and and diversity. So um, it's going to be from the standpoint of a a child, a kid who has a gay uncle. Okay. And and it's going to be all about finding that acceptance. Mm -hmm. And, and just, and, and just really introducing you know, a different concept to younger people. You know, I think that especially nowadays with the conversations that we're having and just where we are in general, conversations are happening a lot sooner. And oh, yeah. I want I want to be a, a resource for th- that young person that never knew that it was okay. You know, I had a gay uncle and it was always hush, hush. Like we knew he was gay, everyone, but it was something that was never talked about because there was this stigma attached and I want to disrupt that. And so, yeah, we're, that's, that's one of the other projects on the horizon. Yeah. Stigmas are just a bad thing in general. Yeah. Yeah. Hiding anything that exists, like the elephants in the room, it's just like, they should just be there and everyone should just acknowledge it. Yeah. Elephant. Like, yeah, I think that, uh, that's actually a, a really amazing concept. And I think um, I was actually talking to one of the other confide members who is a, a, a gay man that lives up in New York and he's one of my favorite people to play video games with. He's super funny. Um, we're both very able to communicate with each other in a lot of uh-huh. ways that are on a uh-huh. deeper level because we share a certain sensitivity. You know what I mean? Like I think with grown men, there's a big stigma behind sharing emotions with each other. And right. Uh, being able to reach that point where you can share your emotions with with your friends as a man is a really big thing it is uh, we were talking about having an episode um especially it being pride month just discussing the effects of being gay and how that's affected your your, you know the mental health uh there's a lot of statistics out there about um how more gay men end up committing suicide than than straight men and i think that has a lot to do with uh, how society has been going through this change and not accepting um, men that are that are homosexual, and I think that uh, it, it's interesting because you 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 look at it and there's a lot of people that are, uh, for instance, that whole example of people accepting lesbians because women are are objectified sexually on a daily basis, but men aren't really objectified as much. Right. And then, so when, when you're a gay guy, people think, Oh, it just doesn't make sense. Or, Oh, this is a bad thing. Uh-huh. And then you have to live under this, this sort of magnifying glass, um, that definitely affects your brain growing up and, and who you are. And I think that this has been a really golden opportunity to just kind of provide that perspective in and of itself without even thinking about it, having you on the show, Right, in the, you know, right, at, right towards the end of Pride Month. Um, yeah. How how does it make you feel to have, um, you know, looking back? Because you you're 
of the older generation. You're you're probably like ten years older than me, right? Well, wait, don't age me so much. You're you're older than me. All right, all right. So that <laughs> I, means what I'm saying. I'm is 35. Through, no, yeah. <laughs> you've been through this this movement. Yeah. Um, you were here before, during, and after. Like like the the movement didn't really like let's say like back in the 90s it wasn't really out the way it is now right and there right. was still a lot of rejection and non acceptance now today thinking of someone in high school that's gay right um, it's not uncommon <laughs> and it, and it's a lot easier for them to be able to come out and be like yeah I'm gay right whereas back then it was like a really big thing and a really big deal so approaching that from that perspective what how does it make you feel um with this movement how do you how do you feel being in this month and embracing everything not only with juneteenth becoming a holiday but also having pride month and having both right in right in the same time yeah does that does that just is that just like one of your favorite days now it's it's <laughs> it's it's surreal so you know i always approach pride uh from the mindset that it is an acknowledgement and a recognition of the contributors, the spearheaders of this movement, going all the way back to Stonewall, 1969, right? The black and brown transgender people that said enough is enough. And so understanding that to me, yeah, pride, I love pride as a celebration, but I also remember that the original prides were riots. You know, the original prides were not this, this thing. And so I, I, I approach it with both because it's acknowledging like all of the hard work that these people allow us to stand on their shoulders understanding that now we've got to carry the torch and continue it. So for me, that's where the celebration comes in because it's like how exciting that like we now get to carry the torch and and make even more strides for the next generation. Um, I, I love being able to look around and seeing people really confident in who they are. You know, when I was growing up, I went to an all boys Catholic Jesuit high school. And <laughs> so there's just no way in my mind that I could have come out in high school. Like there's right. just like, there's just no way, you know, with the family that I have, the wh where I was in the community, the way that my family was positioned in the community, we were, were they're well known, you know, and they're known for their philanthropy. They're known for all of these things. And so I knew that that just, I could not do that in that way. And so to be able to see young people standing up saying, this is me. I think that is beautiful. And I think it speaks to all of the work that has been done, but it also shows how much more needs to be done. Right. There's always going to be that room to grow. Yeah. And I think that's reflecting off of that. I went to a private Christian school and uh, I, there was definitely a few gay people that went to my school, but it wasn't really public. But like we all knew. We all fucking knew they were gay. Right. Like 100%, right. there was no doubt in our mind, like, yeah, that person's gay. And we all loved them and cared about them. But I don't think there was ever a point where they were, like, super open about it. And I think that had a lot to do with uh, the school we went to. I mean, I, I got kicked out of the school because they found out I had had sex with my girlfriend completely outside of the school, away from it, because it was against Christian philosophy, pretty much. And they're like, so since you did that, you're, you can't go to school here. And I think Bullshit. that, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think we, we all live, uh, cause for me, I think, um, there was a, a big part of me learning to accept myself. Um, I had a, a really close friend, his name was Blake and, uh, we played music together for well over a year and he passed away from cancer, um, wow. in 2020, March 5th. Uh, so a little over a year ago. And, um, there was a point where we had tripped on LSD together and had a very big soul moment. And it was actually the first time I'd ever felt gay feelings towards another man um, on an emotional level. I'd always had physical attraction to other men, right? But um, for me to have sex or anything like that, I've always had to have some sort of an emotional thing. So I never really considered myself um, bisexual until that point. And it had never been anything that we, we made action out of or anything like that. Um, but it, it was like, for me, it was different because um, it's not that I was ever scared to open up about it. I think it was like I had to really discover myself more because I, I right figure out that. what it is. Exactly. Because like, <laughs> like 
it wasn't something that I could just put in a, in a cabinet and ignore, right? Those, those right. feelings and those emotions I had. But it also wasn't something that I wanted to just like open the jar up and just throw it at everyone I knew. I don't think I <laughs> right. even talked about it on stream. But um, <laughs> so this is kind of kind of a, a coming out, so to speak. But uh, acknowledging and, and getting to a point where I could understand that I had attraction to men and, and that I was that. And then also um, now approaching this polyamorous relationship um, and seeing how the world is moving forward and it makes you more comfortable. You know what I mean? To be able to have an open space and not feel like you have to hide who you are and that you can be confident within yourself to be who you are and to express those things compared to what we were before. And I yeah. think that, um, we all have things that we don't really put in in front of other people that we that we keep inside of ourselves and i think right. that, uh, the the confidence comes from being able to tell that story and being able to because <laughs> life coaching is something that i've been interested in getting into with my whole situation from my friend who died from suicide my friend who died from cancer um from the recent things with my wife and now my new relationship and everything kind of ties together into what is my story and i want uh -huh. to take that and be able to utilize that to help other people i and love so, that i think that you're definitely a huge inspiration and i appreciate you coming out and, and being being here um, I appreciate it. I love this has been that I mean that hour flew by my goodness <laughs> oh, 100%. that's why whenever we do this this podcast we always our time frame is always an hour to two and a half hours and then when we hit two we're like okay we need to like crunch because we just get talking and talking and there's so much that you can approach with mental health from every perspective from everyone's stories um so I did have one viewer who came in and she said, um, I have struggled with self-confidence since a very young age because the person I trusted the most and looked up to most of my life made it his job to destroy my self-esteem. Now as an adult, I'm still lost and I just wish I had confidence because I feel like it would make such a difference in my life. I don't even know where to start to build back up. What, what would you say to her? I would say that you've already started. The, the fact that you're able to acknowledge that and speak it and post that, that that's the first step, right? So you have started. So give yourself the grace and space and the credit for that. I believe that you have started it. Um, I also would invite you to connect with me. I'd love to, I'd love to see if I have something in my toolbox that can help you. Um, but even if you don't decide to reach out to me, understand that it's a decision that we make every single day, right? And it's not easy. It's going to suck. It's going to hurt. But understand that your future self depends on it. The We, we weren't put on this planet just to live and die. And you did not go through that just to go through that. So I would really invite you to explore the impact that, that having confidence would make in your life. And conversely, think about how the lack of confidence and what that lack of confidence is costing you in every area of your, of your life. And let's set an intention. Why is having confidence important to you? What is having confidence going to bring to your life? How will your life change for the better? And I think that when you begin to identify those whys, you will naturally start feeling yourself moving towards a more confident lifestyle. And for anyone that does want to connect with, with, uh, with Norman, how, how would they go about connecting with you? So I've made it super easy. You just can go to connect.overthetopliving.com and that has literally, it's my link tree. So it will have every, like I have my website, Instagram, Facebook, um, all of that is right there and you can connect with me, uh, uh, Instagram preferred. So I just put that link tree in there. Um, you said Instagram is preferred. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you have a TikTok? I do have a TikTok. Um, my name on TikTok is the Mr. Liverpool. And on my TikTok, you can find 60 second clips of confidence building videos. So, you know, I, I always come and say, hey, this is Norman J. Liverpool, the fourth, your confident lifestyle coach. And then I'll give you about 45 seconds of, of, of some confident building um, words of wisdom. Okay, I got to follow you real quick. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've been so I've been wanting to put out 
I just made my TikTok and I haven't made my first video at all yet because I've been wanting to put out um, smaller clips as well of just like mental health um, mm -hmm. advocacy tips, especially clips from like podcast episodes. Um, like there's some stuff that have been said here, like because it's so funny because there's things that I've said that I've never really said before that I was like, wow, that should be like a video. You know what I mean? Like right. that should be put out there. And I think that's like, that's one thing to have this open space is such a fortunate thing. And I feel like I'm, I'm very lucky to have stumbled upon this idea and to be able to have the people that I, because I find them consistently and I connect with other people um, on a regular basis. And they always bring like a new light or a new, uh, new existence towards um, our existence and, and our comprehension of mental health. So yeah. uh, as far as the next pages, I'll, I'll just run over them real quick. Um, I think I have three more. Uh, remember, you're not fooling anyone. Your energy will always tell on you. <laughs> Time is out for faking the funk. Your energy speaks before you open your mouth. Confident people are okay with expressing exactly how they feel at any given moment. And guess what? You're a confident person. So I think with this one, it really tags on... Um, passive aggressive people as well um, yeah which i have i have a tendency to be passive aggressive but i also have a tendency to not say exactly what i'm feeling and like in the hopes that someone will kind of guess and that's something that i think a lot of humans do and it's something that you really have to get out of and understand that people do feel your energy and do see what you're you're doing and what you're approaching um the next one was teach your friends how to friend um which is kind of played off of how the whole you are who you hang out with thing but also um they are you you know like when, mm -hmm. when they hang out with you they become more like you so try to be more of that leadership role in a friendship and um make sure you have friends that are trying to give you what you need as well as allowing you to give them what what they need that's right, right. that's right so I, I i really liked that one and then um the other page i liked was Stop hiding behind your gifts. They already made room for you. The very things you're hiding are the things that will change your life. Fuck the folks that made you feel you were less than than because they were intimidated by your greatness. You're a star. Shine bright. Boo. That's right. <laughs> and I, I love the little pet names that you put in there. It was just like... Because well, that's really how I speak. Like, yeah. I say child and boo and honey. and Like, that's the way I speak. And it was really important that it was translated in my book because right. it's this is me so i wouldn't I, exactly how i wrote is exactly the way that i speak and it's just like you said with the whole not everyone is your client well not everyone is your reader you know that's like, right like the people that do read it they they're there reading it for a reason they're not it's because in in some way shape or form you're touching them right um I know you wanted to do a little book giveaway. We do have yes. a few people in chat. I'm sure we could work something out. Um, how did you want to go about that? So what I do is I'm actually going to do three copies. So we'll do three copies. So all you have to do um, is, and I'm only going to give away three. I just ask that you go to my Instagram, the over the top living. So it's on Instagram. It's the hat uh, at over the top living. Give me a follow. And then DM me the word confidence. And that will put you into the drawing. And I understand that some of your viewers are their later stream. So I'll keep this going until midnight Pacific, midnight Pacific time, which is 2 a.m. Central. Okay. Um, and then all you have to do is message me the word confidence and that you heard me here on this platform. And then I will go through those entries and select uh, three, three winners. And I'll, I'll just make a post on my page for that as well. So anyone that wants to get into that, that, you know, whenever they get off work or whatever, they can do that and leave that up to you. Um, yeah. Once again, I appreciate you coming onto the show. It's been amazing. It's been a very heartwarming experience to have you. I know every time like I've experienced you, even on my Facebook feed, it's just like a, you exude this positive energy. That's just nice to have around. So I, do well, I love it coming in. No, thank you for having me. It's been my pleasure. And anyone that wants to check him out there, I posted the website in the chat um, to his link tree. Um, also, just a quick reminder to everyone in the pinned comment in my post, if you have Spotify, we do have a mental health playlist. Anyone that has been touched by any sort of music in any way, shape or form is welcome to add 
that music onto the playlist, um, including you if you have Spotify Norman. You're welcome okay. to on the playlist and throw some music in there. It's just basically like if it made you feel happy, if it made you deal with your sadness, whatever it may be, throw that music on the playlist. You're helping a lot more people than you know in, in having it. that. And um, yeah, I think this is a good cutoff point before we get to the point um, of babbling. Anyone that does <laughs> want to support him and just buy the book or buy. Uh, it is sure. available on Amazon. That's where I got mine. Yep, it um, is available on Amazon. Where where can they get the shirts? So the shirts, um, right now you can't yet. We just released them last week. Well, they just came out last week. So, but very soon they will be available on my on my website. Oh, on your website. Okay, cool. Well, let me know when they're available, and I'll share it to my page as well, so that anyone that wants to get a shirt can get a shirt. Um, awesome. This has been an awesome episode of Confide Cast. We will post this on YouTube. Um, later tonight and i'm glad everyone that showed up once again we love everyone that showed up and dedicated any time to listening to this yes. um you guys mean the world to us and we will see you on the next episode all right thank you <laughs>